So you can uh, turn your Bible or you can swipe right in your Bible to the second epistle to Timothy, chapter 2. I'm just going to read just a couple of verses here. Starting at verse 11. Paul says, The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Then to preface some of what I'm going to say, because it, it matters, and you might, you might think, based on what I'm going to say, that I must have had it kind of, kind of rough growing up. Um, <clears throat> and that's the furthest thing that is from the truth. I grew up in church. I'm a, I'm a PK, which is why I look the way I look. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a pastor's kid, but I had all the advantages that... Christians want for their kids. I had Christian parents who raised me in church, who homeschooled me, who got me up for Bible studies, who loved me, who put enough rules that I didn't go and off the rails, but not so many that I wasn't allowed to be myself. My friends uh, were very jealous of sort of my parents' parenting uh, prowess. They just struck the right balance and got it right. And despite all of those advantages and having as good a parent as you can have, that didn't save me from having a default theology that that almost drove me out of the church. You can't parent that stuff out. You just have to beat it out every day. And I have a distinct memory, a distinct memory, and it's not the the memory of, of the worst thing I ever did or the biggest sin I ever committed. That stuff came later. But when I was, when I was 15 years old, I was... I was stealing cigarettes, this sort of thing. Not, not major stuff. Not that that's not, I mean, that is a breaking of a commandment. But uh, I, was, I was stealing cigarettes and, and doing like low-level rebellious kind of things. And we used to, we used, me and my brother, who was a little bit younger than me, we used to sneak out of my, my bedroom uh, about three o'clock in the morning, this was our custom. And um, one night we had a friend over, and uh, I, I, we had some cigarettes and stuff, and, and we snuck out of the window at like three o'clock in the morning, and we made our way down to the bridge, uh, which is down below my parents' house. And we would go underneath this bridge, and we'd smoke cigarettes and discuss the really, really weighty matters of teenage life, like girls and sports and girls, and music, and girls, and that, that was what we did. And the reason this memory is in my mind is because my brother, he turned to me and he said, do you think we're going to hell? And I remember my response, it was certain There's no wavering in it. Absolutely positive. I said, of course we're going to hell. And why why would I think that? Was it because I was underneath the bridge at 3 o'clock in the morning smoking cigarettes I had stolen early that day? That's kind of what you think it might be, but that's not what it was at all. That's not why. I was underneath a bridge 
smoking stolen cigarettes at 3 o'clock in the morning because I thought I was going to hell. So why not be? Because I had defaulted despite everything that I had going for me. I had defaulted into thinking that I had to maintain this thing that somehow God was very displeased with the fact that I was not very good at good things. I wasn't that disciplined. I didn't pray the way I wanted to. I was distracted. I, couldn't, I was behind in reading plans. I, I couldn't do this stuff. And I thought, literally, that Christianity just maybe wasn't in the cards for me. Not because I didn't believe it. I, be, I don't remember a time in my life where I did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he lived on this earth for 33 years, that he went to a cross for the sins of the world, and that it was necessary to believe those things to be a Christian, to make it to heaven. I have no memory of not believing those things. I believe those things as absolutely true and at the same time saying, of course I'm going to hell. How is that even possible? Because what we all do, I think that it's enough to get me in, but not enough to get me there. And I wasn't good at the rest of it. And so I remember saying, you know what, maybe when I'm older, Maybe when I'm older, I'll, I can do this thing. Not because I wanted to spend the next 80 years of my life just doing whatever I wanted so I could and then have some kind of be- you know, deathbed conversion at the end, just you know, roll the dice. I'll probably get cancer, so I'll probably have like a window. It, was, it wasn't that. It was maybe when I'm older, I'll be more disciplined and I can actually do this. I'm still kind of waiting for that to happen. It might happen when you're 40. Does it happen when you're 40? Is that when that happens? Is that when everything just falls in line and you're just, no? You just check the boxes easily, no? Hmm. So you fast forward. You fast forward double that time. I'm 30. And I'm a Lutheran. Don't worry, I'm not very good at it. Uh, <laughs> and, but I've got my theology straight at this point. I've got the, the T's crossed, the I's are dotted. I mean, we are justification by faith people. We are reformational Christians. I've got a confession that's very detailed on these things about grace alone, not by your works. And still, I would wake up, and I still wake up every day thinking, that God is either going to be more pleased with me or less pleased with me, or he's going to be upset with me or really, really rejoicing over me based on, based on how I do that day. And so I was 30 years old, just about five years ago, and I was sitting in a truck at a gas station and I'd had a horrible day. I lost my temper with my, my wife, and we were fighting about I don't know what, but it was, I mean, I'm sure it was my fault. She, she's 
a lot sweeter than I am. And I had to like leave it like that because I'm arrogant and I'm stubborn and I had to go lead a Bible study. So, you know, I have like, we're not, we'll do this later. I've got to go teach people the word of God. And, uh, and I go and this Bible study is an epic disaster and nobody shows up and it's just me at a coffee shop, and except for this one dude, one dude that I didn't really want to be there in the first place. <laughs> and he's like really interested in talking to me a lot. And I'm just like not feeling it, so I blow him off. I'm just really, I'm really crushing it. And I'm driving home, I just, I, I pull into a gas station, I don't even want to go home. I just don't want to do it, like, this failed at everything. Left my wife angry, blew it, like, apparently nobody, apparently I can't get people to study the Bible with me, and then I'm a pastor, so I don't know, that's not good. And, <laughs> and then God brings this one dude, and like, I don't like him, and i like, that's not good enough. It's, it's, and so I'm just sitting there, and I, and I listen, and I turn on the radio. There's no shortage of Christian radio stations that are playing Christian stuff in the South, okay? Uh, and so I turn on the radio, and this dude on the radio is talking about that text I read. Have you ever heard a guy just, like, get the tone of a text totally wrong? Like, maybe they're preaching in Matthew 11, and they're like, come all ye weary. I know some of you are. We got to come. <laughs> Jesus said it. Do it. <laughs> Joe, you know you ain't come. Everyone in this building knows you haven't come. You better come. And you're like, I don't know. Like, that's, <laughs> is, that, is that like the vibe of this? I don't get, I don't think that's what's going on here at all. That's what this guy was doing with this passage. And he was, it's like he did a full stop. He's like, if you deny him, he'll deny you. Stop. Like as if that was like the end of what Paul said. And then just is beating me to death with all the ways that we deny him. And they were all true. So it wasn't that he... It was wrong. His tone was awful. But he's just beating me with the law, which I probably needed some of. And he talked about Peter. And he said, you know what, you know what Peter's problem was? You know, what, you know what Peter's problem was when he denied Christ? He didn't hold fast. I was thinking about not just my day, but my life. Thinking, man, I suck at holding fast. And he's. And it was at that moment that I first said the words out loud in my truck with tears running down my face in the form of a prayer slash hope. Christ hold fast to me. And so I opened Twitter, which is my custom, uh, after that. I immediately felt better. And because um, I was like, that's good. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it sent out the first tweet with the, with the hashtag Christ. I didn't really think much of it. Uh, and all of a sudden, all these other people were doing that thing. And now we're here five years later. But, um, but I started to think more and more. And as I think back, to what this guy was doing with this text, 
And, and the fact of the matter is that that text says, it says that if you deny him, he'll deny you. I mean, there's no way around it. That's what it says. So what does that mean? Well, it can't mean what this guy was saying it means because he was using Peter as an example and Peter does deny him but I don't see anything in Scripture about Christ denying Peter. I see him saying before he denies him, I'm going to intercede for you. You're going to return. And when you do, encourage your brothers. I see that. I see a, I see a Jesus that is, that is going to intercede for his betraying comrade. What does it mean to intercede for someone? He's going to plead with God on the behalf of someone who can't hold fast under the pressure of some girl asking him, don't you know that guy? No. To the point where he'll do it with an oath. I'll swear with an oath I don't know that guy. Jesus is going to intercede for his friend. It doesn't mean that. It can't mean that. Because the gospel, the gospel is not about how, how sure your grip on any of these truths is. It's not, it's not about how sure your grip on Christ is. It's just not. And we say that kind of stuff all the time, like, man, just, just white knuckle to Christ, bro. Just you're like it's gonna, you're gonna get through it. And but everyone know everyone knows in reality that our grip is just not that good. And we think that we're losing that grip when we fail and we struggle and we fall. We have those bad days and we believe God is upset with us. Or we have those good days and we think something even worse. We think he's more pleased with us. But Christianity isn't about improving your morals. It's about God loving and saving immoral people who wanted nothing to do with him. It's not about the little engine that could getting a, some grace in the engine and then climbing the impossible mountain. It's about train wrecks that derailed like five minutes in. And I have, to, I, I have to outright reject. I reject a Christianity whose goal it is to make people who look like they need no Christ. I just reject it. Stop trying to make Christians people who look like they don't need Jesus. Jesus. And we believe this. I, I still believe this every morning when I wake up. That somehow what this is really about is me not needing Jesus as much as I did at the beginning. Or I'll end up believing that this is actually about my faith. How much faith do I have? How much do I believe this? Maybe I can't, maybe I'm not getting better. Maybe, maybe I'm not like really, really, really improving. But maybe I'm just believing more. And so I'll start examining my faith. Start looking to my faith. And there's a tyranny in that that will destroy you. Because your faith is garbage. You know, when Jesus talks about the mustard seed of faith. We take that and we say, mustard seed of faith, you can move a mountain and throw it in the sea. 
How many of you guys have ever done that? Your faith is not very good. But the reality of that text is Jesus isn't isn't saying that to encourage mountain moving. Like what we need done in here is we need, what would be great is that when I arranged the world, some of these mountains weren't exactly where I wanted them. In hindsight, I'd have done it a little different. If we could get some faith, we could fix this whole thing. No, the point of that is to show you how little faith you have. A mustard seed's worth can move a mountain. And I don't see any of that happening. But a mustard seed of faith can move a mountain of sin and cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. And that is the point of saving faith. I uh, was thinking about what I was going to say to you guys about two weeks ago. It occurred to me that I had to say something. And it's like, and uh, I was in my office, and the doorbell rings, and I go to the door, and there's two Mormons there, and they made some really good points, and I converted, and that's really what I'm talking about now. <laughs> no. Uh, I, 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 there's two young guys. It's always young guys. They're on their mission. And I was like, man, right back to that day in the truck, right? I'm like, man, am I so terrible at the Great Commission that people, that God just puts people on my door? Like, where I'm not, like, and even then I'm like, Re-? like I don't want this. Like, these, I got people that need Jesus right here. And like, I don't want to do it. Because I'm trying to write this thing where I'm telling people who already believe in Jesus about Jesus. I ain't got time for this. <laughs> so they, they say to me, do you have a few moments to talk about Jesus Christ? I said, I do. What would you like to know? <laughs> Which is... Which is how you just bump them right off script, right off the right at this. I recommend that move, because all of a sudden they're like, oh no. Like. But I, I invited them in and and got to know them a little bit. And they said, Do you have any do you have any questions about the LDS church? I said, no. No. And it was interesting because one dude, as I talked to him, I said, let's just get to know each other a little bit. And one dude had been doing this for two days. He was two days in, and he was, man, he was zealous. He was was about it. And he was, God was pleased with the work he was doing. And you could, he was dependent. The other dude had been doing this for 18 months, and he looked exhausted like, he, like, totally knew that, dude, this is, I can't wait for this to be over. I'm so trashed. It's tough. It's tough earning your salvation, man. At 18, 18 months in of earning that every day knocking on doors, it took a toll on this guy. And so I, I said, you know what? I do have a question. This is what I would like to know. You have to understand, I mean, I didn't, I didn't let the cat out of the bag that I was a pastor or anything. Um, and when I'm at home, I look like someone that really needs Jesus. <laughs> like, like, this is as good as it gets. At home, at home it's, it's, a, it's a thing. But I said, this is what I want to know. I want to know, how does God save a sinner? How does God take a sinner and do what Paul says, transfer him from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his son. And how complete is it? That's what I want to know. And the zealous one, the other other guy just was like, 
but the zealous one had to, he had to go in. And he said, <laughs> he gave a perfect evangelical answer, and it was horrifying. He said, well, life is a test. Eh. I mean, I didn't, do, I didn't do a buzzer or anything. But <laughs> uh, said, life is a test, and nobody's perfect, because that's our problem. We're not perfect, uh, which is true, and it is our problem, but it's a lot worse than that. But no one's perfect, and so Jesus comes, and he dies on the cross for our sins so that we can be forgiven, and then he gives us grace to do better. And I said, like, what if I don't? Like, what if I have times where I get worse? And then, like, I get better. But then I get worse. They're like, well, God knows. God knows the thoughts and intentions of your heart. See, like, now that's horrifying right there. Like, 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 that's not, you're trying to comfort me. Like, he knows, he knows deep down, you know, what's going on. So he knows that you really really deep down are about it. And you would, that you desire, and at least, like, I was like, dude, this is like the hor- most horrifying news I've ever heard. Because, like, I will tell you something about yourselves. And why am I talking about me in a living room with two Mormons? Because this is an evangelical conversation. I've had this conversation over and over and over and over again with Protestants that say the same exact thing to me. I had to tell them, guys, the best you is the one you're fronting to me right now. This is the best me. You go one inch deeper than this and it gets worse. You're two young guys living in an apartment in a strange place. Are you telling me, like, I know that the you in my living room is the you that you're selling. That's as good as it gets, man. The thoughts and intentions of your heart are not better than what you're showing me right now. You know what was missing? It was missing from the whole conversation, and it's always missing. And so many of the conversations I have with Protestant evangelical Christians is there's no imputed righteousness of Christ anywhere. Forgiveness, yes. Righteousness, absent. And that's what I'm banking on. I'm not just banking on being forgiven. I'm banking on I, that I am declared and made perfect because of what Christ has done, that I have his righteousness, that it's gifted to me, it's credited to my account. That's how I'm getting in. And when you don't have that beat into you over and over and over again, you end up waking up with this theology that says, it's time for me to do all these things to make God happy. Yeah, like my past has been wiped clean, but like my, the future is in my hands. I gotta start earning now. It was just gone. And that, that imputed righteousness of Christ, that is what Paul means when he says, when you're faithless, He's faithful because he can't deny himself because to deny you is to deny his son and that's not happening. To deny you is to deny the righteousness of his son and that's not happening. You're in Christ. His righteousness is yours. The end. But... 
if you deny him, he'll deny you, means something. What does it mean? I'll tell you what it means. In light of that, since he can't deny himself, and since when you're faithless, he's faithful, so this isn't about how great your faith is. It's this, it's this. To deny Christ is not to say, I want to believe, help my unbelief. It's not that. It's not to say, show me the nail holes and the spear wound and I'll believe. It's not that. It's not the doubter. It's not the skeptic. It's not the one with weak faith. Deny Christ is to say, I'll stand in my own righteousness. Thank you very much. That's what it is. It's to deny the work of the Son of God on your behalf. On that day to say, I will stand in my own righteousness. How dare you take what is mine and give what is yours? I've done a pretty good job of this. And I think I can be weighed and measured and come up just fine. The denial of Christ is a self-sufficiency of your own righteousness. You're good enough. This is why Paul uses that language when he's talking to the Galatians. It's the only time he talks like this. Oh, foolish Galatians, you, you've been severed. Why? Because you don't have enough faith. No? No. Why? Because you're not getting better. No. You're adding to the finished work of Christ. You're not resting in his righteousness. You, you think you can do this. It's the only way to be severed. It's the only way to deny in a way that you will be denied because you're ref, you, it's the refusal of everything that Christ has done. I have noticed that no matter how big a legalist you are, that people preach different to the guy in hospice with like seconds to live and the 15-year-old youth group kid or the 35-year-old Burnout, or the 36-year-old pastor. I've noticed that no matter who you are, you preach different to that person. I think that's interesting. When someone's on their deathbed, you could be a total, total fundamentalist, legal, moralist, all those bad things that we hate, you know, the, all those words that we throw around to insult people and have to repent of later because it's, it's, not, it's not good. But you could be all those things, a total, total anti-everything going on here today. And if someone's about to die, all of a sudden, like, Christ is sufficient. All of a sudden, Christ is enough, and they will, they will preach that dude into heaven. And that's great. All of a sudden, it becomes... Dude, all you got to do, I mean, all it's going to take, this is Christ for you, shed blood, all the forgiveness of sins, confess it, it's over, you're good. But if you've got like, I don't know, a year to live, that that presentation is very different. (laughs) And I'm freaked out by that. Like, you got a year to live, it's like, I'm going to give you some information, I'm going to talk to you about this, and... uh, and then if you're interested in some discipleship and learning like what it really means to be a truly devoted follower, a follower with adjectives, you, could, you, uh, you get with me and, uh, and, we'll, and we'll talk about that. And uh, you know, we're going to talk about counting the cost and we're going to talk about you know, bear, you know, carrying your cross and you're going to have to go to, you know, you're going to have to go die too. And there's all this stuff for you to consider. Uh, and then if you're in on all that, I'll give you some good news. And uh, that's how that goes. But not if you're dying. If you're dying, suddenly Christ is sufficient. And I think 
that maybe we should just assume everyone's dying and we should preach to everyone that way. What if we... What if we preach to everyone like we preach to the guy in hospice? What if we preach to everyone this thing? And we said, Jesus is your everything. He's everything. He's your righteousness. He's your holiness. He's your justification. He's your sanctification. He's the whole of redemption. And if he's not, you're not wholly redeemed. He's all of it. That he's enough. What if we told them that that's all it took? That's ever all it took. Because you see, your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus doesn't lie. And he said he loves you, and that his righteousness is yours. He says that he's faithful when you're not. He says he will never leave you or forsake you, so bring all your history, and he doesn't blink. He doesn't blink at what he's bled for. The thief on the cross got in with some sola fide on 11. He, uh, let me tell you what faith alone really looks like and how the dogmaticians have maybe overexplained. There's a guy on a cross next to the Son of God bleeding for the sins of the world And he says, I know I'm a bad person. That's confession. I know I deserve this. I'm getting what I deserve. But that guy, that guy's done nothing wrong. Remember me. Done. Done. Good enough. Jesus says, done. Like, we'd be kind of skeptical of that. Like, I don't know. I mean, like, he doesn't probably understand the Trinity. And he doesn't really, I mean, <laughs> like, and he probably, like, I don't know if his atonement theory is, like, really, like, up to snuff. And uh, there's, I mean, what's his confession? His confession is this. I'm bad. He's not. Remember me. Good enough. I'm going to close with a story about an old pastor who told a story about when he was a young pastor that rocked him. He had just taken a call, and when you take a call to a church, a lot of times you have these, uh, you have what are called shut-ins, so they're people that are sick, who can't make it to church, and you go visit them, or, or maybe they're in nursing homes and this sort of thing. And so when you, when you take a call and you enter a church, a lot of times you have this shut-in list, and you don't know these people really because you're the new pastor, and and, uh, but you got to go visit them and introduce yourself as the new pastor. And, and there was a, a man on this list, and he was, he was in a retirement home. This young pastor would go and visit him. But he had Alzheimer's. And he never remember him. He'd always call him some other name. So he'd have to reintroduce himself every time, explain that he was the pastor and And so he does this for about a year. And this guy's health fails and fails, and eventually this pastor gets the phone call that he's going he's gonna to die today. Remember that preaching to dying people? 
And he goes and rushes to the hospital. There's this man. He goes up to his bed and he grabs his hand. He's like, think on Christ. Remember Christ. And in a moment of profound theological Holy Spirit granted clarity, this man says, young man, I don't think I can remember Christ. I think he remembers me. And Christ does, and he did. And he remembers the thief on the cross. And he remembers you, and he remembers me. And he holds fast when we don't, when we can't. And that's the truth. That Christ holds fast to me and that truck was enough. That's always been enough. And it will always be enough. Amen.